যদি তোর ডাক শুনে কেউ না আসে তবে একলা চলো রে ছি <laughs> friends welcome to another session of the festival of chasing lab organized by the prabha khetan foundation that was established in kolkata in the 1980s the organization is dedicated to socio cultural welfare and humanitarian causes in more than 35 cities in india and across the globe in the last two pandemic years when virtual became the new normal the foundation shifted its gear to match the need of the hour and with dollops of love from our viewers and patrons we kept going during those dreaded days of the pandemic we at prabha khandan foundation successfully curated virtual events to keep the morale of our patrons and viewers high today in this scintillating session of the festival chasing love we have the queen of word and wit the prolific shobha day who has defied the age clock as effortlessly as she has kept us enthralled by her writings the quintessential jackie collins of india best known for her scathing observation of modern society she was nominated amongst the top 50 india's most trusted people compiled by the readers digest list in 2019 no surprise then that more than 17 of her novels have become best sellers making her the most read author of her genre her books have been translated into many languages and the rise of women writers of fiction is accredited to her daring voice and thought her latest book lockdown liaisons is a collection of short stories set in the time of the pandemic her stories sensitively depict how adversely covid has affected the well-being of the world even as we struggle to make sense of altered realities and get accustomed to the new normal that will emerge in a post covid world 
In conversation with her today, we have author Kiran Manral, who promises to take us on this exciting trip with the author. Over to you, Kiran. So, hello, Shobha, and welcome to this conversation about your latest book, Lockdown Liaisons, which is a fascinating collection of short stories. I read it very swiftly over the past couple of weeks. And Thank you. It's know. a pleasure to be talking like, well, to be talking at all. In these, <laughs> but uh, I wish we could have been a uh, witch shiny at a wonderful, glorious festival in person, but this is the next best thing, I guess. And who are we to complain the new normal? We all jolly will have to, yeah. Yeah, get used to all of it. And that's what amazes me, Shobha, because while all of us are sitting down complaining about this new normal and this isolation and creativity going for a toss, you have bought out a collection of short stories and your creativity did not uh, get in any way hampered. So how did these short stories emerge? What happened to... Well, they actually emerged. It was a panic attack. Uh, it was a response which was uh, a desperate response to a desperate situation. Uh, no one had any idea how the pandemic was going to, you know, unroll over the next, uh, whether there's going to be two weeks, 10 weeks, 10 years, 10 months. So the uncertainty and uh, the fear around it all, the lack of knowledge at that point, we didn't know the beast at all. I don't think we still do. But mm -hmm. it uh, sort of rattled the whole world. It, um, it sent our sense of self, our sense of security our sense of what we could take for granted uh, just was such a toss. And this was my response because uh, I felt uh, as someone who's always chronicled her times, it was important to chronicle these times because they were unprecedented. And uh, it was important to record what I was going through in my own unique way, I suppose, uh, while we were still in the throes of fear mm -hmm. and um, uncertainty and uh, didn't know whether you know, we'd wake up the next morning. So I started the short stories, found my voice, and it was important that they were launched during the pandemic, published during the pandemic, so that it wasn't something like looking back on the pandemic. It was why it was actually happening. There was a sense of urgency. And I'm really glad that my, um, my publisher, Simon & Schuster, thought the same. So they came out as e-books, four stories a week. And then finally, the product you are holding in your hand. I, well, I, have, I do have a question about, you know, what you would do if you went back to these stories now, but we'll come to that later. Right now, I want to know why the short story format? I mean, you was there any specific reason you chose a short story format for this one? Yes, because I was also in the process of wrapping up a novel at that point. I was writing Srila Ji, uh, also with Simon and & Schuster, and I was more than midway through it. And so it was a simultaneous kind of writing process. I would write a short story a day and then go back to Srila Ji, then get back into the next short story. And it was very organic, but it was also something that was um, like a compulsion. Uh, and I felt that if I did not occupy different skins and voices, I would not be able to capture anything beyond my own feelings of being, whether it's trapped or claustrophobic or insecure or questioning my own relationships, it would be too, too, too me, me, me. It's, I'm feeling this, I'm going through this. And the novel just didn't uh, seem to be the right way forward. And the short stories also allowed me to think beyond myself, beyond fiction. In a way, yes, fiction, because these are characters that were created. But the uh, first person voice also gave it that urgency. What I like about these stories, uh, I find that while you've started and some stories are very, very angry, there's yeah. a sense of closure and resoluteness and, you know, hope that comes out with some stories as well. So was this the process you went through in your emotions itself during uh, the ride? Completely. I was furious. I was furious with myself, with the world, with what we were all going through. I was furious with my husband. I was furious with my daughter. I was furious with the pets. I mean, it was the whole world, uh, you know, kind of uh, telling you that your life isn't what you thought it was and there's no plan for the future. And uh, when things were so out of control and there was death and despair, that's all we woke up to. And it just 
just seemed it was not focused anger anger actually it was just something so diffuse that it had to find an outlet or i would have ended up god knows it, doing what uh, with my most loved ones when we were together and uh, we knew that it was something that we have to endure uh, as a family uh, just as the whole world was uh, enduring whatever they were enduring far worse than what we went to went through so thank god for that but it was tough it was tough for everybody yes so then the anger kind of uh, after a point it was uh, replaced by much more introspection and uh, then finally a sense of hope and uh, it was um, looking forward to the post pandemic world but we are still in, in the midst of it at that point we didn't know absolutely well, there are various themes that run through these stories i want to talk about uh, all of them but love and isolation are two things that i want to touch upon because this is the festival of love so while there is love let's do the isolation bit first there's a lot of isolation even in characters who are surrounded by people so this entire mood of isolation that you bring through in the books and you go through various uh, people uh, social classes kinds of people there are women there are men you write through different voices so was there any uh, process that you decided i want to speak about this man in delhi who stuck somewhere uh with somebody who's not he's not really comfortable with and i want to speak about this woman here in bombay who's married to this man who doesn't understand her. how did you choose your characters was it inspired by what you saw around you how did that happen well the cliche would have me say that they chose me which is which is almost almost correct because we were being uh, the kind of assault from media from television from newspaper uh, you know people sharing their stories in print uh, we were getting a whole bunch of stimuli and stories coming in from all over and each one was so real and so passionately felt it was tough but uh, some of them stayed some of them didn't stay and uh, i don't like the morbid so i try to avoid something that was terribly painful because personally as a writer and as a person i i'm not i'm not very good at handling uh, crises which are medically driven i it sends me into a kind of a funk which is very difficult. i can't write if i'm feeling that but i could certainly connect to relationships that were breaking up because uh, of the situation and uh, unplanned uh, kind of developments in their own lives which were directly the all, all of their life being directly impacted by a a virus thousands of miles away that had taken over the world so i think the biggest uh, victims of the pandemic apart from all those who lost their lives to covid-19 and subsequently to uh, omicron uh, which is still on was i think the biggest victims were young people in love or even older people uh, who thought they were in love or older people uh, in stable relationships who could no longer take that stability for granted so the biggest hit was taken by love and romance at one point so uh, it brought a few couples much much closer but i also know that the divorce rates went up because i have a divorce lawyer friend who say she's never received as many calls from particularly from women uh, stuck in abusive relationships for example and they they kept asking her but and the and the courts open even virtually just get me out of this uh, relationship and that was so tragic because even had they legally been able to get her out or him out of a of a terrible relationship where would they have gone you would still be stuck in that uh, space together so yes i'm i i really felt uh um, very very strongly about uh, uh the kind of uh, price that love relationship romance all of it we all paid a huge price absolutely we all paid a huge price and there was we all know the statistics on domestic violence have soared during the pandemic and uh, not just uh, women i think even the children stuck in the homes yes some of your stories were infinitely touching in Uh, there is a story about a sari that's woven for somebody's wedding, 
and we don't meet the protagonist at all. And uh, what happens to her and the sari that is worn from her is always just implied. And there's so much tenderness and fragility in these stories. Thank so you. Uh, what I was curious about is writing a story without even telling us about the protagonist. What kind of, sort of challenge that did that pose to you? Because you don't see her, you don't hear her, you only know of her through the weaver. <laughs> But the weaver is the protagonist. The huh. sari is the protagonist. The sari is, is, a, yeah, is a symbol uh, of so much more than just the lady who will be wearing it. Wearing it. So uh, it's all that a weaver invests in that sari. And mm -hmm. I had come back from Banaras and I uh, go there frequently. I spent a lot of time with those weavers. And they were so badly hit by the pandemic. Uh, I mean, uh, Varanasi, the weavers were actually starving. And they didn't even have menial jobs that they could turn to because for centuries, their families knew one skill and that exquisite skill of leaving the Banarasi uh, was something that had been snatched from them and they had no idea how they would ever recover any of that or whether they'd even be able to go back to, uh, because of the business they'd lost, go back to a skill that was uh, their identity. So for me, uh, um, understanding the weaver's crisis was uh, in a way, uh, very uh, something I felt very emotional about, and the sari and the person you don't see symbolized their loss. That was lovely. But another thing that I really liked, Shoba, about your stories is while you speak about different strata of society, there's a way uh, your view is very empathetic. You're speaking about a woman who is uh, in a very luxurious life, who's divorced from her husband. And her husband has gone to someone else who's completely the opposite of what she symbolizes and what their marriage symbolizes. But there is this underlying empathy for the other woman as well, which comes through. Yeah. You think that through the pandemic, as you said, a lot of people did come closer, but a lot of realizations and a lot of marriages that just drifted apart because they realized that love no longer existed between them. Did that also happen apart from the domestic violence bit? And... Uh, apart from, you know, all the extraneous factors that sort of came onto us at that point? Well, I think marriage itself uh, went, uh, the, the idea of marriage uh, got redefined uh, during the pandemic. For most people who'd been married for, say, uh, 10, 12, 20 years, it was the taking for grantedness in that marriage. Uh, a certain dullness had crept in, a certain... Uh, you know, we're together, but are we really together kind of a feeling? Uh, do we even know each other? Is this the same person I married? Is this the same person I fell in love with? Because uh, during the pandemic, the kind of survival skills that were required emotionally, psychologically, and physically tested a lot of couples. So I felt, uh, why not take a, a kind of uh, unvarnished look at marriage? Because when, you, when you're put through something like this and you start to doubt even your most basic feelings towards your partner or even replace them with a strong sense of loathing, even contempt, uh, then you have to reconcile yourself to the fact that fundamentally the marriage was not what you imagined or dreamt it was. And uh, when that happens, a certain disillusionment sets in. And a lot of people gave into that. But there were others who were, I think, a little more introspective on a deeper level and decided that this person is my partner. We've been through some great times together. And it's not always been, uh, you know, one merry-go-round and fantastic life. But there is a sense of commitment that we're going to see one another through this, no matter what. So the story that you're referring to is... Uh, also, for me, a very special story because a, a woman who has been haunted by bitterness about the other woman, imagining her to be some kind of a money-grabbing, vampish, um, nothing, not belonging to the same class and the same background, not having the same reference points, eventually turns out to be a very vulnerable and broken uh, woman who has actually brought a great deal of um, of love and caring and nurturing uh, to the husband they both shared in a way. So it's all important also for the other woman not to be always projected 
as this uh, demonic creature. And it takes a lot also from a discarded wife to come to that realization yes. and um, sense that whatever she felt was threatening was not a threat at all. It was the it was the natural way that things happened and probably in the best interest of the man they both loved. While there are these stories, this one was really exquisite. It stayed with me for a long time. I also liked a story which is about a romance that didn't really take off, a romance that between two men who meet occasionally, who go for walks, who, uh, who are in the same neighborhood. And there's that what might have been, you know, yeah. uh, that what could have happened if they had the space and the time and the freedom to go on with their meetings. Yes. And, uh, I think those are the most exquisite stories where you don't know what's going to happen and what could have happened. What do you think mm. would have happened to the two if the lockdown had not come in between? I'd like to think that they would have found a way to be together. But then I'm an incorrigible romantic <laughs> you know, behind this facade. And I always like happy endings to love stories. And so it was also for me difficult to keep it the way it was and write it the way it was written. Also with a young girl who leaves her partner behind in Delhi and comes Delhi. to Mumbai okay. because she has no choice and is stuck with her parents and sort of falls in love with the other beautiful young girl she uh, meets when she's walking uh, in Shivaji Park. And there's a rekindling of love, romance, hope in her life. But that also in that story, it's kind of uh, ends on a negative note because no. in my head, that was going nowhere because she was... Uh, seeking uh, love and companionship with the wrong partner for the wrong reasons and to be attracted to perfume. Of course, we are all attracted to fragrance, but to invest so much in a girl who reminded her of, uh, of love, merely because the fragrance war reminded her of the great love of her life. Well, you know, there was a lot of love stories uh, during the pandemic that didn't pan out as one would have loved them too, but they love you. They're lovely. And uh, very poignant as well, uh, there's a story of a migrant in Bombay who is compelled, to, uh, this also ends with a cliffhanger. He is uh, contemplating going back to his native village, but then he has to well, leave. <laughs> he has to leave uh, someone he loves very much back here in Bombay. That's another unresolved yes. love story. Yes. Uh, I want to unresolved love story but in my head he doesn't leave okay <laughs> uh, in my head he offers her the mango he watches with delight while uh, she bites into this uh, mango and he he thrills to see her hand he knows that what he's going back to will not compare on any level with what he's found with with this woman and there's a lot of tenderness I'm fragility in their relationship too because he's a rough man he's not a man of emotion and he's had a very rough life and that he's found someone and they're uh, compatible without any demands uh, in in any sense except uh, a, an emotional connect and a dependency during this time when she herself has been brutalized and he's been he has seen himself as being a brutal person but clearly he's not. Uh, so the mango, again, was symbolic of that. It's like, you know, biting into the forbidden apple. Okay. Instead of that, it's an Alfonso mango in Mumbai in Islam. So very, very uh, there were lots of little symbols. Very yeah. appropriate. Would you say love is a character by itself in your stories? Well, if you're saying it, I'm happy to appropriate it. <laughs> I hadn't really looked at it like that. These were just the stories that came to me and I was uh, happy to write them because it was also cathartic. And uh, that whole process of letting my own emotions be uh, in a way transferred into the characters. And uh, the tough one to write was of course the migrant story, but I had spent time uh, not as a research, but only because I was interested in their lives. Uh, in Bombay is full of these ghastly new constructions with migrants and for for me the most poignant and the most tragic image of the pandemic from our part of the world was definitely the long walk home by those migrants 
and as a, a, a government in complete denial and uh, telling us that well the long walk never really happened <laughs> and a lot of uh, really good hearted people responding to the crisis and uh, we saw the best uh, of emotions caring humanity from uh, people one would have really not associated with something on that scale like a sonu sood for example Mm-hmm. or lots of uh, just anonymous people reached out to the migrants with food and clothing and and all of it so yes it was difficult to 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 uh, think of myself as a migrant but i think i succeeded not too badly cuz lilith dubey has just picked up five of the stories not just a few months ago and uh, they're being performed and joyce and gupta performs the migrant It's so powerfully i cannot even tell you it is a it's a theater experience not because they are my stories but it's lilet and her team and the brilliance with which they have brought these stories alive and uh, it just feels fantastic each time i have watched it i've cried so that's on my must watch list i must get back sometime and when everything gets back to normal and watch those stories i also wondered now that you know we are in the last leg of the pandemic hopefully and this is going to peter down would you have written any of the stories differently i'm losing you again oh one second do you want to repeat that kiran because i couldn't hear your question okay now that we are almost hopefully out of the pandemic do you think uh, you would have rewritten any of the stories differently anything you would have changed about them anything at all um i know i'm kind of done with the stories and uh, i said what i needed to say and i don't want to extend this experience because we're out of it my mind is already working on something completely different i'm in a different zone and i think the world is also pulling out of uh, the most terrible time the world has ever seen uh, and ev- every one that i know i is looking for creative solutions to match the new mood uh no one wants to go back into that dark pit so no i would i i'm not planning to write another collection of uh, post pandemic stories at all i'm looking at a sort of a happier and uh, breezier and uh, a more effervescent kind of a book so totally look forward to reading that one a final final question now we've explored love we've explored isolation we've explored all this do you think as a, as people what have we taken away from the pandemic apart from the grief apart from the devastation apart from all the unhappiness that we've been through is there anything that we've learned and taken away about love about belonging about connecting i think so i totally think so karen the fragility of life in relationships has shaken us all and we have discovered how precious it is to uh, demonstrate our love not just uh, take it for granted not take the people in our lives for granted but even whether it's uh, friends colleagues there is a, a softer emotional landscape that i see ahead uh, because we were put through such turmoil and to come out of it a uh, feeling actually how precious is life and how beautiful is the potential and it's within us all of us to tap into that to invest in love will give the world its highest returns in the post pandemic period because we discovered the power of love and caring and sharing like never before that's lovely and on that note let us all invest in love and let us hope that the post pandemic period makes us more considerate value up uh, the people around us the people we love more and here's to the next book thank you so much for taking time thank out you. for this thank you thank you that was marvelous thank you such a privilege take bye bye on behalf of the foundation i would like to thank ms shobha day and ms kiran mandral for the session i would also like to show my gratitude to our presenter shri cement limited last but not the least I would like to thank our audience and patrons without whom this session would not have been possible thank you